If you've been with us for a while now, we've been working through the Gospel of Matthew. And in this part of the story, Jesus has been traveling around throughout the region of Judea, where he's teaching and doing miracles. He has calmed a storm. He cast out demons out of possessed people. He's raised the dead. He's gone to feasts with tax collectors and sinners. And it seems like his kingdom has got all this momentum behind it. All he does is win. But then he meets some opposition. He, the Pharisees, the religious leaders actually blaspheme the Holy Spirit by saying that Jesus is just doing all these miracles with the power of demons. And while many people are beginning to follow Jesus in these days, there's still a very small minority in Judea. And so in the passage that we looked at last week, Jesus pronounced some woes on the cities where he had gone to preach and do miracles because despite the clear evidence of his authenticity, they didn't in general repent. Some individuals did, some individual people came, came to faith in Jesus, but for the most part, those cities rejected him. Those cities seemed like they were the people who were waiting for God, they were going to synagogue, they were opening their Bibles on a weekly basis, but then when God showed up, they rejected him. They didn't want this king, and this is how it normally goes for the majority of people. Christians were never in the majority in the days of Jesus on earth. They weren't in the majority later as you go into the book of Acts. They were definitely a substantial movement. That first mega church in Jerusalem quickly grew to 8,000 people almost overnight. But the whole region of Judea was possibly 600,000 people. The Christians were a minority. They were, they were a tiny little light that was small but couldn't be hidden in the darkness. Or to use another analogy that Jesus gave us, they were like the salt of the world. And like salt on meat, the salt is small in volume relative to the meat, but it radically alters the taste of the whole thing. But despite the power of their movement, most of the people in the land rejected Jesus altogether. So Jesus pronounced some woes on them. He warned them that judgment is coming. And a question for us is how are Christians supposed to think and live in a world that seems like it's rejecting Christ? We all experience the pain of, of seeing people that we love and towns we love and a nation we love, for the most part, reject an authentic faith in Jesus. Or we'll see people settle for externals without faith and repentance and just kind of call themselves cultural Christians without, without ever coming to know him. I think sometimes one of the shocks of the Christian life is that we become Christians, we get caught up in the enthusiasm, we look around and we see so many people coming to Christ, people being baptized, his kingdom is clearly on the move, and we just assume everybody out there is going to love this stuff, and then we go out and we realize that they're just not as excited about Jesus as we are. So how do we think and live in a world like that? How do we react to a world that reacts that way to Jesus? Well, the best place to look is to Jesus. So, so Matthew 11, verse 25, right after he denounces those unrepentant cities, Matthew eleven twenty-five 25 says this. I'll read our, our whole passage to start. It says, at that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So walking through this, this passage, starting in verse 25, it says, at that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father. To stop right there. In this world that is, is rejecting Jesus, in this world of darkness, in this world where 600,000 people are telling him to go away, maybe 8,000 people are liking him, Jesus thanks his Father. It's so easy when you run into that wall of resistance to what is right or the constant drip of people who seem like they're rejecting Jesus or, or the mockery of what's good in the media or in politics. It's so easy to become bitter and cynical, to just murmur and grumble and to wake up just sort of looking for something to grumble about. Jesus never denies the reality of the world that he's living in. He's just pronounced woes on those cities, but he doesn't stop being thankful and turning to his father in gratitude. 
The darkness doesn't displace gratitude for Jesus, and it shouldn't for us either. Thanksgiving is supposed to be a major part of the Christian life, even in a world that seems like it's totally rejecting Jesus. In fact, if you do a search for the word Thanksgiving in the New Testament, you'll see verses come up that make you think that Thanksgiving must be the just totally central to who we are, and that Christians must be some of the most genuinely thankful people on earth. 2 Corinthians 4.15 says that as God's grace reaches more and more people, that just increases thanksgiving to the glory of God. So more Christians must mean more really thankful people for God's glory and his grace. 2 Corinthians 9.12 says our giving causes an overflow of thanksgiving in those that it reaches. Philippians 4.6 calls us to pray with thanksgiving as an alternative to anxiety. Colossians 2.7 says that when we're rooted and grounded in Jesus, we abound in thanksgiving. And that's not because things are going well in the world around us all the time. I mean, just those passages were written to people in the cities of Corinth and Philippi and Colossae, and those were not cities where just about everybody became a Christian. The world was dark there too. And despite that, the Christians were called to gratitude. So we need to ask ourselves, if we mainly wake up looking for problems to bewail and idiots to mock online and reasons to justify our cynicism and negativity? Or do we look for the evidence of God's grace and give thanks? There was no excuse to not give thanks for Jesus or in that world of early Christians, and so therefore there's no excuse for us either. The family might seem like it's crazy, but God is at work somewhere there and can be thanked. Our culture shows many of the signs of rejecting the true faith of Jesus, but there are also real bright spots where God is at work and we can thank him for what he's doing. Our church, like all churches, has darkness and difficulty and confusion in pockets, but God clearly at work revealing himself and changing lives and comforting and drawing people to himself and caring for people through his people. And so we don't deny some of the negative realities, but they don't keep us from giving thanks. So Jesus, always perfect, thanks his father, and specifically he thanks him for his plan that he's carrying out. Verses 25 and 26, it says, At that time Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, still very much sovereign, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. So he's thankful here that God is working out his plan. These people who are rejecting Jesus are doing so because there are things that are hidden from the wise and the understanding. So what does that mean? And why does Jesus thank God for that? Like he looks at this world where so many people are rejecting him and he says, God, you've hidden these things from the wise and understanding. So thank you for carrying out that plan. Why would he be thankful for that? One of the accusations that people make against religion is that it creates really unpleasant, smug people. And that's not wrong. If you believe that you've gotten a relationship with God because you're smarter or better than others, or that you've achieved your way to some enlightened state that all the other people haven't achieved their way to, you'll definitely become arrogant and smug and unpleasant. It's, it's almost like you can cast out the, the demons of some of your wild living sins, but then they get replaced with the equally repugnant demons of self-righteousness that move right in. And if you're living under that self-righteous religious kind of system, you'll keep trying to prove yourself by belittling others because self-righteousness is inherently insecure. You'll make sure that your record of achievement spiritually is constantly highlighted. You'll contrast that with others in your mind and sometimes in your conversation. You'll be really quick to point out everybody else's flaws in the areas where you think you're strong or in the areas where you think your flaws are still hidden. Religion like that, and that is most religion, is really destructive. But Jesus came bringing a whole different way where we don't come to know God by human achievement or by being superior, but by being like a child, verse 25. And a child by nature is dependent. 
You know, a child can't achieve but is dependent upon his parents for life and food and protection and guidance and navigating the world. You know, a baby, even if that baby has just kept you up all night crying, still expects you to care for her in the morning. An adult would never expect that. I mean, if an adult were to scream, cry in your face and spit on you and throw his food on the floor, expect you to do all the work and he's not going to do any of the work, he, he shouldn't expect any good treatment from you. But a baby can do all those things and then the second that he lifts up his arms and says, up, you pick him right up. Like you're, you're there to care for him. He trusts your goodness despite his behavior. And Jesus is bringing this way where, where we become Christians, not by being wise enough or doing enough good or being good enough, but by being like a child. By recognizing our need and the dependence and the inability that we have to get ourselves there and then just trusting the Lord. And this is so different than religions that say, if I'm good, I go to heaven. Jesus here is thanking his father because his father's plan is very different than the plan of religion that says, be good so that God will accept you. God in his wisdom has ordained this way of salvation that's not by human achievement or wisdom or effort. And that's why Jesus is thanking God for it. Paul speaks of this same thing in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, starting in verse 18. He says, for the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. For it's written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where's the one who is wise? Where's the scribe? Where's the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. So God in his wisdom set it up so that the world could not know God through our wisdom. In other, ways, in other words, God designed the way that people come to know God and it's built into his design that you can't come to know him through human wisdom alone because then you'd have something to boast about. You're wiser than other people and therefore you know God. God has this plan for people to know him and the way to come to know him is not by achievement of any kind. It's not by being good enough to get to him. It's not by being wise enough, by being disciplined enough. It's by being a child. It's by recognizing our own inability to save ourselves and just calling out to him for mercy, saying up and trusting in him. We don't come to know him by achieving. And if God had devised a way to be saved where human effort or human wisdom could connect us to God, we'd either be depressed and insecure because we know that we fail to achieve, or we'd be arrogant and obnoxious because we think we've achieved enough. But the gospel plan is different. On the one hand, it humbles you because you realize that you're a sinner and that you do fall short. But then on the other hand, it secures you because you know it was Christ's faithfulness, not your faithfulness, that got you connected to God in the first place. To become a Christian is to be a child in the arms of your father. Humbled by your own inability, but secure in his love. And it's only in Christ that you can be humbly confident and happily insufficient. And it's only the message of the cross that can do that for you. So God devised this way of saving people where we are never the solution, not our works, not our wisdom, not our goodness, just his cross, just that Jesus died in our place. And if we turn to him, not with our works, but just with the empty hand of faith and receive that, we can be forgiven. Okay, so then how does he prevent us from coming to God by thinking hard enough and then boasting that we're smarter than other people? Well, he's made it so that our message sounds foolish to people who will evaluate it only by human wisdom. Again, verse 21 says, for since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. I mean, we believe some foolish things. We believe that the universe was created by a being that nobody has ever seen fully. We believe that a virgin conceived and gave birth to a baby who was a God-man. 
We believe that Jesus was crucified, died, was buried, and then on the third day, he rose again from the dead, not just spiritually, not just in our hearts, but he got up out of the grave and started walking around. And you don't believe that stuff because you're smart. People who are really wise don't believe that. In fact, many of the wise people today, it seems like there's a big movement of people who are very wise in the eyes of our culture who are beginning again to affirm cultural Christianity. They're kind of coming back to the fold on the outside um, because Christianity does so much good for the world and they feel like we can't live without it, which is absolutely true. But then because they're wise, they're still calling these kind of beliefs myths. And you can affirm a cultural Christianity and that loving your neighbor is good and you can still be thought of as wise. But if you affirm that God became a man, never sinned, rose again, was conceived of a virgin, if you believe those things, you're not going to be wise in the eyes of the world. Those things are folly to the wise. I mean, smart people can, through thought and research, come to the conclusion that Christian principles are good and build a strong culture. But smart people don't say that virgins conceive. You have to believe that with faith like a child. You have to bow. God, in his wisdom, made sure that being smart doesn't make you more likely to believe the truth about him, so that if you do, if you do come to believe, you'll have nothing to boast about. You have to be humbled to come to him. You have to bow. You have to lower yourself. So Jesus in Matthew 11 says that God hides these things from the wise and the understanding. But the good news is that he reveals them to children. So if you come to him like a child, recognizing your need and you trust your father, he reveals these things to you. And so Jesus thanks God for that plan. Thank you, Lord, that this was your gracious will. Thank you for not having a plan of salvation where people could achieve it on their own because that would just create a sea of toxic religion and the world already has plenty of that. So in the midst of his sorrow over the the sinfulness of the world, Jesus thanked God for his gracious plan. Okay, but how do you ever come to know your need? I mean, if we believe what we believe about fallen human nature, that we've been so corrupted by sin that we won't believe what's true about us and we won't want God in our lives, how is there any hope for anyone? I mean, these cities rejected Jesus when he showed up. What made the difference for the few people in those cities who came to believe? Well, the next thing that Jesus dwells on here in the midst of this fallen sinful world is the purpose of God. Verse 27, he says, All things have been handed over to me by my Father. And no one knows the Son except the Father. And no one knows the Father except the Son and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. So despite the fact that much of the world is is choosing to reject God, Jesus is reveling in the fact that the plan of God is still being worked out. Jesus has been handed all things. And even though the world is filled with with people who are evil and hard-hearted, even though it's filled with a proud resistance to the gospel all over the place, the Son chooses to reveal the Father to some who will come to know him. We, like little children, couldn't even know what we most needed without it being revealed to us. And if we came to know our need and we came to see Jesus as the answer, that's because Jesus revealed him to us. Nobody knows the Father except the Son and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. And so if you do believe these things, if you have bowed, if you have yielded to Jesus Christ, all the glory for that goes to God. That means that he chose you. That means that he gave you the gift of faith. Jesus speaks here like like God has the ultimate choice in salvation. And he speaks this way elsewhere. In John 6, 37, he says, all that the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. So there's some people that the Father chooses and he gives them to Jesus and they all come to Jesus. And then everyone who comes to Jesus gets received and accepted by Jesus. God does a work on the hearts of people so that they do come to him. God takes people who are unable to come to Jesus gives them to Jesus so that their eyes are open to the beauty of Jesus. They get the gift of faith. They choose Jesus and they come to him. 
and there's never been a single person who came to Jesus that he rejected. So his plan is super comprehensive. Jesus didn't just die and offer it to all and say, whoever comes to me, I won't reject because he knew that everybody on our own would reject him because none of us want to be like a child. Jesus does all that. He dies and he offers it to everyone and says, come on in. Anyone who wants it can have it. And then the father does more. He gives some to Jesus so that they recognize their childlike need and they're enabled to come to him. All of those that he gives to Jesus do come to him. He says something similar in John 6, he says, no one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up the last day. In John 6, 65, he said, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it's granted by the father. On our own, we have an inability to come to Jesus, but that doesn't stop his plan. It's true that we would never seek God if he didn't draw us. He has to open our eyes and our minds and our hearts for us to come. But the good news is that he is at work drawing people. Jesus says in John 15, 16, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask the father in my name, he may give it to you. So we believe because we've been chosen. We're not chosen because we believe. And I know we don't naturally like this. We like to believe that I control my own destiny. I'd rather be a competent grown-up as opposed to being a totally dependent child. In fact, part of our resistance to Jesus naturally is that he's a threat to our sense of control over our lives. And we fear, I'll lose control if Jesus comes in, and we will. But he wants us to rest in the fact that God is carrying out his plan, despite how dark the world seems. Because all things have been handed over to Jesus. And nothing for a second is outside of his control. Jesus rests in this. And so, so he's teaching predestination here, but not as a club for winning theological arguments and owning the Arminians, if, if you know what that means, but as a pillow for your head in a, in a hectic world. The fact that God is in control is a place where we can rest. Jesus never let go of the wheel to begin with. He's the God of Isaiah 46, 9 and 10, where he says, For I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand and I will accomplish all my purpose. He accomplishes his purpose. He's the God of Proverbs 16, 33, where it says, The lot is cast into the lap, but its every decision is from the Lord. And we know from verses like Romans 8, 28, that God is working all things together for good for those who love him and who are called according to his purpose, which means that he has to be working things out right now, not just in the end. Because you can't plan the ends and not plan the means. He can't be a God who's in control of the big picture, but not of the details, because it takes significant attention to detail to make all things work together for our good. You can't plan a trip to Florida without planning the drive or the flight and the hotels and the food and how you're going to pay for it. You got to plan all those details to say that you've planned the trip to Florida. Just saying we're going to Florida doesn't do any good if you're not willing to do all the things that it takes to get there. God can't just promise that it'll all work out in the end, but then not work anything out to get us to that end. He must be in control of all things. So he's in control now and he's able to work all things together for our good. We can rest in that. When we see communities around us destroying themselves and families falling apart, or we look into the eyes of a friend or one of our children when they seem so confused and hurting and sometimes living for themselves, part of what gets us through is a big view of God and his sovereignty and his reign over all things. This means we don't have to wake up in a panic about politics and obsess over polls and how the truth just keeps getting twisted all over the place. We don't have to panic about that stuff at all. 
The religion of our culture has a very small view of God and a very big, big view of me. Where I'm sovereign, I'm the master of my destiny. And if God's in the picture at all, he's kind of my good luck charm or he's like Dumbo's magic feather. You know, he's just sort of there to encourage me. I bring him along. We have a very small God and a very big me in our culture. But a big me can't fix the broken world. But if I'm the biggest thing there is, then that puts a ton of pressure on me to work all things together for my good. And I can't do that. I can't be in control enough. I can't anticipate enough. I can't think through enough or plan enough or manipulate enough to ensure that it'll all go how I want. But we try. Because if we remove God in our minds from his position as the sovereign king over all things, we always treat that like a job opening. We always step into that role. We try to fill that void and we're really bad at it. And so much of our anxiety and worry comes from not believing that there is a big God who is in control. Because if he's not in control, then I have to be. But this mind-blowingly big view of God, a God who's in control of all things, yet in some unfathomable way, not the author of evil himself, who is shaping all things for his glory and who invites us into that story for our good, that's the view of God that's presented by scripture. And it's only a God like that that can guarantee the promise that all things work together for our good. God must be a God over all things without a rogue electron in the universe. And so in a chaotic world, Jesus thanks God for his plan. He dwells on the purpose of God. And then he makes this huge promise in in verses 28 through 30. He says, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now, just in case you take that previous part about predestination to mean that Jesus might reject some people that come to him, he makes clear here that if you do come to him, he'll give you rest. He doesn't say, if you come to me and I decide you were chosen, then I'll give you rest. He says, if you come to me, I'll give you rest. And if you come to him, it's because you were chosen. He invites everyone in. He turns nobody away. And the promise here is that if we labor and we're carrying a heavy load, he'll give us rest. So if you're laboring, if you're working hard to live a life that could maybe make you acceptable to God, he calls you to him instead. If you're heavy laden, if you're just weighed down by by life so much, If it's driving you nuts that you're in the middle of all these situations that you can't control, Jesus says, come to me. And for sure, he's he's strong and bold and he denounced the unrepentant cities. But with the penitent, Jesus shows his heart and he says, I'm gentle and lowly of heart. Dean Ortland points out that, that this is the only place in the gospels where Jesus says what his heart is like. And he says it's gentle and lowly. And Orton makes the case that, that this means he's both humble and accessible. Which is so remarkable because in this same passage, he identifies himself as the son of God. So he's high and holy and meek and lowly. He's the one that you can always come to. And so you're saying, oh, but, but all my problems are mine. I'm the one who's messed up my whole life. It's not just that what's out there that's messed up. It's what's in here is messed up. How could I then come to him? Well, the broken and humble always, always, always find a place of rest in him. I think we've all probably known people that we could just never talk to about our problems. Like if a crisis comes up or there's something going on, we know that that person's going to jump down my throat, going to use all my weaknesses against me, take my secrets and stab me with them, betray me, gloat over me. It'll be like they won if I go and I bring them all these things. But hopefully you also know somebody that you desperately want to talk to when you've fallen. 
the person who will listen, the person who always has a place on their couch or at their table for you, the person that you just know will be gentle and hear you out no matter what you've done? Well, if you come to him broken, Jesus is all that and more. By nature, he's gentle and lowly. By nature, he's humble and accessible. And here he calls us to take his yoke on us. Uh, There are a couple different kinds of yokes that are described in the New Testament. Uh, One is the kind of yoke that would join two animals together, so like two different oxen that would join them side by side. And so like 2 Corinthians 6.14 uses that as an analogy when it says, don't be unequally yoked with with unbelievers, um, that you're not supposed to be yoked side by side, like in a marriage type relationship or something with somebody who doesn't know the same Lord, isn't going in the same direction. Um, But there's also just a human yoke um, that was just sort of a tool for carrying a burden. I found a picture of one on the internet that could put up. And so it's just kind of like a a post that you would carry over your shoulders to help you balance a load on both sides. And the Pharisees were people that Jesus said used to load up those buckets. They used to give heavy burdens for the people. Matthew 23, verse 1, it says, Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, the scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. So do and observe whatever they tell you, but not the works they do. For they preach, but do not practice. They tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on people's shoulders. But they themselves are not willing to move them with their finger. So they would load up the buckets and tell people to do things that even they didn't do. They would demand that you carry more, not them. And this is what happens. When we go to religion for relief, it just gives us more to do. We go with our guilt, and it gives us more guilt. We go needing help, and, and it just puts more in our buckets. But you go to Jesus for relief, and he puts a different yoke on you. An easy yoke. And that word for easy can also be translated, translated kind. He's kind and gentle. There might even be some irony in here. He's like, I'll give you the lightest possible load. The load of my grace, totally free. He'll give you rest. So you might be here just carrying such a heavy burden. The burden to prove yourself to God or to others so that you you could think of yourself as acceptable. The burden to impress. The burden to fix yourself entirely. The burden to put on a good face, to hide your true self, and even a burden to save yourself. We'll even do this with church, where we turn church activities and church busyness into a self-salvation project, working hard to earn our value. But Jesus is better than that. He carried that beam himself when he went to Calvary. He takes the whole load away and then he loads you down with kindness. And he says, rest. Rest, rest in him. He says, come to me. And he promises that if you do come to him, he doesn't reject a single person who does. And when you come to him, you find him humble and accessible and kind with a load of grace to replace the load of guilt that you've got on your back. So turn to him believing in his cross and his resurrection. Turn to him trusting in him. Come to him humble, confessing your sin. And you'll find him gently, gentle and lowly of heart and you will find rest for your souls. As Christians, when we take the Lord's Supper, we're reminded that we don't come to God by our own achievement or by bearing burdens ourselves, but by the achievement of Jesus and the way that he bore our burden for us. We believe that he went and died on the cross and was buried and rose again. And when we break the bread and eat it, we're saying that Jesus' body was torn from me. When we drink the cup, we're saying his blood was, was spilled for me. And so, so this supper is not for the people who think that they've made themselves worthy to approach God. This is for people who believe in what Jesus has done, who come humble and repent. And if we are repenting of all of our known sin and trusting in Jesus and his cross and him alone for our access to God, he says, you've got that access. You find him humble and accessible. You're in because of what he did for you on the cross. But if we come proud, boasting, thinking it's our achievements that get us to God, we don't get anywhere near him. 
And so we'll invite those among us who are Christians, who've put your faith in Jesus, who've confessed your known sin to take this Lord's Supper as we sing the next couple songs. And if you don't yet believe these things, we'd encourage you not to take this because by taking this, we're saying that we believe these things. This is a a testimony of the faith that we have. It shows the Lord's death till he comes and reminds us of what's true for us. And so we would invite everyone who is penitent to come and take the Lord's Supper to, to celebrate the fact that Jesus died and was buried and rose again to give us life.